Welcome to Ultimate Stream Live. In our last episode, I talked to Carl Heinz Fink about the Fink team speakers. Recently, uh, Carl Heinz has purchased the brand Epos and has started making the ES14, which is now the ES14N, the new version of the original uh, speaker uh, from Epos. Um, welcome back. Thank you. Perhaps you can uh, tell us a little bit about why you decided to purchase the EPOS brand? Uh, basically because we could. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, I, I have worked with Robin Marshall in the past, I think it was during the mission days when I met him the first time. Um, and later on we did some projects uh, for Infinity, so when he was working in France. Um, and he always, you know, was working in a, in a, in a different way. You know, I mean, this was not the typical mainstream uh, thing. And, and 83, um, in 83, I was starting more or less with my professional career, but that was really, really basic. And, you know, after analyzing the ES14, he was a few steps above that uh, what I was doing in, in 83. Um, and yeah, I mean, I always liked the brand. So I was working with Morden Short uh, when it was, you know, together with, with Epos. And yeah, I liked the brand. <laughs> and and I, I noticed later on that many people liked the brand. Um, so yeah, that's why we then decided to buy it. And it took us two years to, uh, to bring the first product into production. But, you know, there was no, no reason to hurry up. We wanted to do it the right way not the fast way. Back then the brand had a, a huge following and there were some great reviews. W why do you think that was? Oh, because I mean, you know, it was different. It was a fresh thinking. I mean, his minimal approach on crossovers, uh, using a polypropylene woofer together with a, a metal dome. Um, so that was radical in a way. Um, and that's what people liked and the result was nice. So you started by recreating the, the famous model, the, the ES14N. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the speaker's original design and what you've done to update that? Yeah, I mean, two-way system with a 7-inch polypropylene cone woofer, underhang voice coil, so, you know, large gap and short coil, and a metal dome. Um, 25 millimeter um, in a ported design with a minimal crossover of I think one component who was just using one capacitor um, and that's what we investigated um, but honestly speaking we did it in a different way um, there's a lot that has changed in technology over those years. But I, I always try to find out why he did it. Um, and the reason why he didn't like uh, crossovers is that in the past, crossovers very often um, interacted with the, with the loudspeaker drive units because we know that driver has four ohms, uh, but this four ohm is not constant, but more important is it's changing with the position of the voice code. So there's always some modulation of the crossover with the changes of the impedance of the driver. Um, and that was a problem, uh, but nowadays we, we know how to stabilize the uh, impedance and the inductance over excursion. Uh, so we could remove um, the problem uh, that you can get by um, using a crossover. So what Robin did was using some mechanical tricks in the drive units, so like some mass, for example, or some multi-layer voice coils, uh, because you need to do something. So the roll off of the woofer is, is, is happening without crossover. But I personally think, you know, why should I, you know, put my crossover into the drive unit and carrying it around all the time if I can fix the problem of the modulation 
and then put something outside that is easy to control, has a better sound quality and is not doing any harm. So that was then one of the things that we changed. Um, but we explained about it. We didn't say, you know, oh, this was crap what he did. Um, no, it was good. But we know a few better ways after 40 years. Yeah. Um, and what about, what about the cabinet design? Um, the cabinet design was straightforward of the, in the original one. It was just a square box with a port. The port wasn't very effective. I think most people just put an old sock or some foam into it because it wasn't what we would call nowadays a modern um, uh, alignment. And I think the bottom end wasn't the strength of the loudspeaker, so there was a lot more. Um, but, you know, that is nowadays a lot easier to do with, with all the modern simulation and, and, and the software and the optimization algorithms that we have. Um, I really tried to make a simple crossover and a 60B crossover. And um, by doing that, you know, you have to time align the loudspeaker units because that's the only chance it really works. Um, and when you have two drivers like a dome and a woofer, the only chance to do that is really tilt them. And that's why we had the, um, the shape as we have it now. You know, it's tilt back. So it's a, a mid bass and a tweeter? Yeah. Um, um, so we left that in. I mean, I, we could have done it with a more complex crossover without doing it, but I said, yeah, let's try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, but not more simple than, uh, you know, than it should be. Um, and that's why the shape changed from a normal square box to, um, to the one that we have now. And in the past, the cabinet was just, you know, some MDF or chipboard. Uh, what we are doing is uh, sort of constrained layer damping construction where we use two layers of MDF in this case with a damping layer in the middle that has a lot better uh, performance than conventional um, wooden plates and together with some bracing that we can simulate again in, in, in software and optimize, you get a lot less. Um, cabinet vibrations out of the cabinet um, compared to the original one. Uh, something that I noticed that was really good and, and for a loudspeaker in, of that age is the position of the port and how he was dealing with the, with the mid-band output that you get from a port because that can be really critical. Um, that was really well done. So amazingly for something in 83. So there's a lot that, is, that has been done that was clever, but hey, 40 years ago, we know a little bit more. What we kept was the um, polypropylene um, in the cone. And people ask me, oh, why you do this polypropylene? Is it not old fashioned? No. Polypropylene is a wonderful material. Um, it's really, a constant material, you know, paper, it depends on how the trees were growing and, you know, how you beat the paper and the fibers and uh, so it's not easy to do. Polypropylene is something that they make in crazy uh, quantities and it's really constant material. But um, polypropylene got this bad image of being a little bit, you know, tired and sleepy. Um, because it was combined with a high damping surround. Um, so if you go to some of the old classic British loudspeakers and you push in the surround and then it, it can, comes back really uh, slow. And that was used to make the response curve nice. Uh, it helps. The problem is it kills the dynamic and so you end up with a loudspeaker that is a little bit sleepy. Um, that wasn't the case on the on the EPOS, so that was using a, um, a low damping rubber surround. 
Um, and nowadays, of course, we use low damping rubbers around. Um, but then you have to make the shape, the right shape of the cone. So that is, in the past you had a shape that worked and then you try to find the material. Nowadays we define the target that we want and then we let the computer simulate different shapes. And then you take the one that works best. And we also use injection molded polypropylene, not like conventional one where you have a foil that you, uh, you, know, you bring into shape. No, it's like injection molding, so you have a tool and you can vary the thickness of the material and that's what we did. Um, and so you also have the possibility with the same tool to use different materials, so different, you know, mica or whatever you want to add. Um, but basically it was also a polypropylene cone and we use a face plug instead of a, a dust cap. That was also the case in the original one and we used it because it was better working. So we didn't use it because we wanted to copy the old one. No, it was really working in a better way. So that was then uh, the choice. Uh, the tweeter, the original one, was a 25 millimeter metal dome. Metal domes are not I mean, I don't know how many people use metal domes nowadays, so there's a lot more soft domes. Um, so the challenge was to do a metal dome that doesn't sound like a metal dome, so it doesn't have any harsh uh, character and shrill character. Um, and I also wanted to have a slightly larger dome, so um, 25, 28 is, is a really nice uh, size classic. Dyna Audio or Classic Scanspeak Tweeter and 4 2 way it's nice. Um, but then you have to really work hard to get the peak that you always have on, on such a dome to very high frequencies. Um, so we managed by, by using aluminium with some ceramic um, coating and also a kind of special ring on a certain area to shift this resonance to 30 kilohertz. So it was above the normal hearing area um, and we also use the filter actually to notch that um, 30 kilohertz out. I mean, one of the first metal domes was from Celestion that had this copper dome and they really had a notch filter uh, to, to kill that notch but it sounded not really nice so the best thing you could do on this loudspeaker is take this filter out it took me a while to find a way to find a way to really take out this 30 kilohertz, uh, and we found one. And then, as a result, you have really the nice, clean openness of the metal without this this really shrill and sometimes really nasty um, character of the um, of the metal dome. So we kept the original material philosophy, but used all the modern technology to optimize it. And that was then more or less what we used in this loudspeaker. Is it compatible with a, a, a wide range of amplifiers or would you say it works specifically well with a, a um, particular amplifier? No, I mean, I, I, I never liked you know, to design a loudspeaker that only works with three special amplifiers. So the impedance is really straightforward, easy load. Uh, even compensated in the mid-band to be used with tube amplifiers. So, you know, many two-ways have a big peak in the mid-band uh, in the impedance and that reacts with a, um, with a transformer of the tube amplifier. So we compensate that. The sensitivity is, I don't know by heart how much it is, 86, something like that. Um, but it's easy load. So every amplifier that is halfway stable I can deal with this one, and even tube amplifiers work well. And in terms of the, the design and finish, the colours, uh, there's, are there three colours initially available? Yeah, so we, you know, we wanted to have one wood colour, and that was then walnut, and black matte, not shiny, and white matte, not shiny. 
in Munich, there was a touch of blue, I think, <laughs> on those speakers. Is, is that something that you're looking at, maybe doing some other colours in the future? I mean, we have to, because so many people are asking me for that colour. We said, please don't ask me to do it in the first batch. Um, so the colour is, is, is a colour that you will find in the company. You know, my, my doors and my office are in this colour. Well, it's our company colour as well, blue, yeah. so, you know. We want to have something that is not white or black. I mean, you know, journalists go on shows and they hate black loudspeakers and they hate white loudspeakers. Uh, so you, you find a colour that it looks nice and we had the light in the room, you know, matching this colour. Uh, but again, many people ask for that. So we will definitely do this green-blue thing um, for you know, at least for some uh, quantity. So what are your plans with the Epos brand now going forward? Uh, more. <laughs> I mean, the, the next, I don't know which one is the next one, but there will be one larger one. So that is a, um, a stand, uh, you know, that is the floor stander. So using two of those woofers and a smaller one, a smaller one with a five and a half inch, slightly more than a typical five inch using the same dome tweeter and something that can go really in you know somewhere closer to the wall not something that needs to be in free air uh, with two meters around um, so it's a real hopefully a real uh, loudspeaker that um, yeah can be integrated in on on sideboards or whatever so yeah, hopefully a problem solver for many people, including myself, by the way, <laughs> because I need something as well in this size. Well, we're just about to receive our, our demonstration stock, so I guess the, uh, the doors will be open rather a lot for the rest of the winter with people coming in to have a listen. Hmm. So uh, I wish you every success with both Fate Team and EPOS. Um, so from the man that bought you the, the musical washing machine, we now have the, the regenerated um, EPOS range as well. Um, Karl Heinz, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. It was thank really you. fun. Great. If you'd like to take a look at our portfolio of products, then please do have a look at our website, ultimate-stream.co.uk. If you'd like to have a home demonstration or indeed come into our studio to have a listen to any of the products, please do get in touch by emailing me steve at ultimate-stream.co.uk. Bye for now.